Hi, let's pray. Father God, I pray that the words that you've given me to share today come from directly from your heart and go directly to ours, and that through them we are changed to be more like you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Today's Bible readings are John 2, 1 to 11, and Revelation 21, 1 to 7. So today we're looking at Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And every time I read it, I just have to ask, why? Why is your first miracle turning water into wine? What even is that about? Why not raise the dead, calm a storm, heal somebody? Water into wine? Why? But Jesus isn't the type of person who would do anything haphazardly. The man has a plan. And that plan was that all of his signs and miracles should do two things. Firstly, they should cause us to believe in the messenger and not just the message. John makes it clear to us in the final verse of our reading today, verse 11, where he says, This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus re revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. You see, when God does miracles, he doesn't just want us to believe in the miracles, in the signs and in the wonders. He wants us to believe in him and to cause others to believe in him. The, sign, the purpose of signs and wonders is to point to the power, person and reality of God. Not for us to have our fill of wine and bread and money and glory and fame or whatever we get out of the miracle. The point is not the message, but the messenger. And secondly, that we should not reduce his miracles to mere signs of his power. Instead, we should see them as signs of God's, of Jesus's person and work, signs of his divinity and signs of his divine intentions for the world. We should not see the miracles of Jesus as supernatural disturbances of natural order, but as supernatural restoration of nature, of God putting things back how they should be, restoring his world to his settings. And as we heard in our second reading from Revelation 21, Jesus' miracles point us to that day when sin and sickness and sorrow and death are no more, because Jesus will have made all things new. That said, the restoration of order is easy to see in most of Jesus' miracles, such as the feeding of the hungry and the healing of the lame, exorcism of demons and the raising of Lazarus and Jairus' daughter. So I have to repeat my first question, why? Why, Jesus, for your first miracle, did you turn water into wine? What has Christ got to do with the production of a fine cabernet? Throughout the scriptures, we see that wine is a symbolic um, symbol of God's grace and our resultant joy. Unlike water, wine is unnecessary for life. Yet in this first miracle, its abundance is a picture of God's super abundant grace. Our God is the kind of God who likes to give good things to those who don't deserve them. Super, superfluous, super abundant gifts. Yet sadly, us humans are great at seeing those gifts as fleeting pleasures. All too soon, our wine glasses are empty again and we're looking around for our next fix. In the story of this miracle, the wedding party runs out of joy when the wine runs out. And we too look for our joy that can only be found in God in earthly things, like at the bottom of empty wine bottles. Enter Jesus, the Lord of the feast, the master of ceremonies, the vine, and the vintner. 
and notice how he doesn't follow the way of the world, which probably would have been to water down the wine that was left to make it go further. Or watering down the gifts of God, as if to say that grace was limited. No, Jesus makes the very best wine, the wine of grace, available without money or price to everyone who thirsts, and not just another half a dozen bottles to keep them going. His amazing generosity sees the transformation of six full containers of 20 to 30 gallons each. He makes around 180 gallons of wine, which is equivalent to around 900 standard size bottles of wine today. 900 really reminds me of Psalm 23. Their cups were totally overflowing that day. And also, these were no ordinary water vessels, but six stone jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing, which was almost certain a way of Jesus saying that with him around, ceremonial washing would no longer be needed, replaced once and for all by the washing of baptism in the new covenant. Another thing to notice is that John goes out of his way to tell us that the wine was drawn from stone jars and this miracle involves bringing wine from rock. Now earlier in the Old Testament we hear that Moses only got water out of his rock revealing that Christ to be the true and better Moses. The water of the law was given through Moses, but the wine of grace comes through Jesus Christ. Finally, in the first verse, John says, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And it's no accident that the miracle takes place at a wedding. A wedding being one of God's favourite symbols for the covenant he's made with his people. And the third day in the biblical world is symbolic for a day of new birth and transition from old to new. It's also on the third day when Abraham sees the place that God provides for them. And the third day when God meets his people at Sinai. And the third day when Jonah's life is brought up from the pit. And it's even on the third day of creation that God creates the plants that we get wine from. And of course, we know that Jesus' most miraculous miracle happened on the third day when he rose from the dead. So, Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine at the wedding of Cana. Why not raise the dead? Why not calm a storm? Heal someone? water into wine but there's so much in this story so much imagery so much grace and Jesus isn't the type to do anything haphazardly he had a plan and he didn't just provide the guests at the wedding with 900 bottles of the most finest cabernet he provided them with the wine of grace available without money or price to everyone who thirsts. In this first act of restoring his world to its maker's settings, we see a glimpse of what's to come. As, star as, car sorry, as storms are calmed, as the sick are healed, as the sun rises and sets each day and we see the glories of creation. In every miracle, no matter how big or how small, no matter how mind-blowingly obvious, or easily missed. God wants us to see and therefore believe that he's in the business of restoring his world to its maker's setting. Revelation 21, read from the message version of the Bible says this, I saw heaven and earth new created, gone the first heaven, gone the first earth, gone the sea. I saw a holy Jerusalem, new created, descending resplendent out of heaven, as ready for God as a bride for her husband. 
I heard a voice thunder from the throne. Look, look, God has moved into the neighbourhood, making his home with men and women. They're his people. He's their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears gone, crying gone, pain gone. All the first order of things gone. The enthroned continued. Look, I'm making everything new. Write it all down, each word dependable and accurate. Then he said, it's happened. I'm A to Z. The beginning, the conclusion. From the water of life well I give freely to the thirsty. Conquerors inherit all of this. I'll be God to them and they'll be sons and daughters to me. The point isn't the message, but the messenger. And we just need to keep our eyes on the prize because he is making all things new. Amen.